My name is John Stoltenberg, and in this video, I explain and illustrate best practices for framing health messages to boys and young men. For more than a decade, I have been creating messaging to speak to this audience, and I want to share with you what I've learned. This is me in 2008 in front of posters from media campaigns I created on the theme, My Strength is Not for Hurting. Building on that experience, in 2012, I began Media to Change to offer communications creativity and strategy to nonprofits and causes. When you look at a male infant, who do you see? He's a blank slate just starting out life. If he needs any health messages, they're in the form of food, comfort, safety, warmth. Now flash forward to when he's in his teens. Suddenly he's one of the 15 to 24 year old males who are the key public or target audience for health messaging campaigns that are critical to individual and community well-being. Drug and alcohol abuse, drunk driving, texting and driving, HIV and other STD transmission, teen pregnancy, intimate partner violence, sexual assault, I've created sexual assault prevention messaging targeted to young males in high school, college, as well as the U.S. military. The messaging and images in this poster series, for instance, were tested with focus groups of high school students in California. Similar messaging appeared on outdoor billboards and mall kiosks, in radio, PSAs, and in movie theaters. In all the health messaging I've created for boys and young men, I have followed specific communications principles that I will explain and illustrate. This presentation is organized very simply so that by the end, you will have learned and understood ways to frame health messaging to boys and young men that will have the best chance of advancing positive attitudinal and behavioral change. To begin, we have to understand something crucial about boys and young men. Research shows that health risk-taking is disproportionately common among 15 to 24-year-old males. For instance, three of every four deaths in this age range are male, and the leading cause of death is car crashes. Young men drive more dangerously than women and are less likely to use seat belts, and men are the majority of those who drive drunk. I've borrowed this graphic from a popular TED Talk by Tony Porter because it depicts at a glance the gender identity that human males are supposed to conform to. And what's this man box got to do with health messaging? Well, research shows that young men's conformity to gender identity correlates with risky health behaviors. For example, young men's anxieties about being a real enough man increase their sexual risk-taking in a national survey of 15 to 19 year old men, those who held more traditional beliefs about masculinity were more likely to have sex without a condom and more likely to have a higher number of sexual partners than those with less traditional beliefs. They were also more likely to use force or coercion with a partner to obtain sex. And how did the survey identify traditional masculinity behaviors? They were the young men who agreed with statements like these. For boys and young men, risky health behaviors not only correlate with gender identity conformity, risky health behaviors demonstrate and construct gender identity. According to social scientist and author Will Courtenay, a man may define the degree of his masculinity by driving dangerously or performing risky sports and displaying these behaviors like badges of honor or achievements of manhood. In other words, says Courtney, for boys and young men, embracing risk asserts and establishes gender identity against positive health behaviors and beliefs. Messaging to reduce young men's health risk-taking is therefore up against a major obstacle, young men's anxiety about being a real enough man. The more a message triggers gender anxiety, the less likely it will have the desired result. Appealing to men's aspiration to gender identity certainty is therefore counterproductive for any health messaging, but it's especially pointless for messaging to prevent violence against women, since a primary driver of violence against women is men's acculturated need to, approve, to prove and assert real manhood. 
It's a basic principle of communications theory that the motivating self-interests of a key public are central to effective messaging. According to Laurie Wilson and Joseph Ogden, people act in their own self-interests, and unless you plainly identify those self-interests and appeal to them, the public will not do what you want. In the case of the key public of boys and young men, the question becomes one of identifying not only which self-interests, but which self. I'll explain what I mean by that. I've written two books about gender and ethics, one philosophical and one practical, and I've condensed them for this presentation into what I call a game theory of gender. It's a theory that explains why, in young men, there's a tension between two different selves. It happens in the real-world biography of boys, beginning even before the playground and extending well into adulthood. Imagine this is a blackboard and I'm diagramming the rules of the game. Guy 1 says something insulting to Guy 2 about his masculinity or something threatening. I challenge you to prove your manhood. You don't seem like a real enough man to me. You're a wuss. I'm going to whip your ass. If Guy 2 buys into the game, he either has to rise to the challenge or slink away in disgrace. So Guy 2 retaliates, and typically this escalates. So between these two guys, there's now a contest or some sort of combat with words, fists, maybe weapons, and what happens next? Either Guy wins, Guy 1 wins, proves his manhood is greater because he intimidates or injures or dominates Guy 2, or else Guy 2 wins, proves his manhood is greater because he intimidates or injures or dominates Guy 1. This is the interactional meaning of the manhood that every boy grows up needing to prove, and the gender identity he aspires to is always connected to his memory of mano a mano combat and risky challenges from other frightening males. The result is that boys grow up with a bad case of gender anxiety. It's a universal experience of being raised to be a man. It's why boys admire invincible action heroes. But in real life, there's a third possible outcome in which neither guy one nor guy two gets hurt, an outcome in which both combatants prove their manhood and stay safe from each other. What they do is this. They pick on some third party, someone over and against whom they can jointly assert dominance, and they thereby form an alliance or bond. The third party could be someone smaller, weaker, poorer, younger, queerer, someone whose racial, ethnic, or religious community is demeaned and despised, or simply someone female. Structurally, this master plot replicates over and over throughout boys' and young men's lives. Two humans raised to be a man, proving their manhood by putting down someone else instead of threatening and hurting each other. Any individual male can be at times a member of a bond and at times third party to a bond. Remember how risk-taking constructs young men's gender identity against positive health behaviors and beliefs? Now we can see why. The gender game entails high stakes, risk at every turn. The rules of the gender game pitch everyone raised to be a man into a conflict between two kinds of choice making. One kind is driven by his gender anxiety and the risk of failing to prove his gender identity in a social context of rules of right and wrong for conforming to manhood. The other kind is driven by his capacity for moral decision making, which he can express only by not playing the gender game in a social context of an ethic of right and wrong for meaningful connection with other humans. This results in two different identities or two selves, his gender identity and what I call his moral identity. At any moment in time, these identities are mutually exclusive they cancel each other out. But because a boy or young man can switch back and forth between these two selves, these two identities, these two selves based on these two kinds of choice making, we can address the self more likely to respond to health messaging. The takeaway principles for health messaging to boys and young men are these. Don't trigger or re-stimulate gender anxiety, which just cancels out the message. Do address directly young men's capacity for moral reasoning. This means don't, uh, don't promise gender identity certainty as an outcome. That only exacerbates gender anxiety. Just simply don't keep this key public trapped. Instead, 
Do appeal to the self as someone who wants to be seen as having integrity. Do use first-person narrative to model moral choice-making and do show positive social outcomes. To illustrate, here's a storyboard I drafted with found photography to apply these principles in a health message to reduce teenage drunk driving. Car speeding, traffic sounds, young male driver drinking at the wheel, sound of approaching siren, uh-oh, young male driver sees cop car in rear view mirror. Another young man, voiceover. Voiceover continues as the young driver is stopped by cops. We see the other young man now driving soberly past the scene, voiceover. We see him in close-up, he speaks into the camera. His voiceover resumes as we see him among his friends. We see him with a female friend. He speaks into the camera. Voice over. To review, here again are the four messaging principles I just illustrated. In the world of commercial advertising, boys and young men are inundated by messages from media and marketers promising to placate their gender anxiety in exchange for a purchase, a car, a movie ticket, a personal care product. Here, for instance, are examples of ads for Axe, an international brand marketed to young men. The messaging, which feeds on gender anxiety, also fuels it. There's even an Axe ad that mocks young men's experience of having two selves. The theory of moral identity in boys and young men offers a framework for health messaging that stands out from the clutter of advertising that re-stimulates their gender anxiety. The theory of moral identity in boys and young men helps frame health messaging that addresses this identity's unique and specific self-interests, for instance, wanting to make independent decisions, wanting authentic respect from peers, wanting to do what's right for oneself and someone else. Most important, this theory can help us speak personally to the core self from which boys and young men can make good choices. Thanks for watching this presentation. If you'd like to know more, please be in touch.